Hey everybody, Nick here. So in this video, I'm going to go ahead and talk about Michael Moorcock's multiverse and what that is. So Michael Moorcock has been writing science fiction and fantasy since, well, since the late 1950s, early 1960s, basically. And uh, he has been an editor and writer and has written in basically every genre that, um, you, you know, uh, you can think of probably. Um, certainly he's written in uh, fantasy and sword and sorcery. He's written in uh, historical fantasy. He's written in science fiction. Uh, he's written in straight historical novels. He's written in thrillers and uh, probably everything in between. He even wrote comics for a while, um, you know, writing for Fleetway Publications. Uh, in the early 1960s, and, uh, you know, has, has written just an incredible uh, body of work. And uh, I and his, many of his works have been adapted into role-playing games over the years. Uh, um, well, his Elric novels, his Quorum novels, his Hawkmoon novels all got role-playing games. The Elric books also uh, had a board game that was based on them. Um, and... Uh, um, so, uh, so this video, though, is not really going to talk about the role-playing games. I am going to go ahead and talk really about Moorcock's work and kind of the larger sort of body of fiction that he has and kind of um, going to just talk about some things about that that I think are worth noting and are interesting. And also, if you're not familiar with Moorcock's work, this might give you a little bit of a sense of kind of what is out there, although I'm not going to go into any lengthy explanations of all the different series, you know, that, that are out there. Because to be frank, like, there's just too much of Moorcock's fiction. Um, and uh, I, I will give you some suggestions, though, on or some, some information, anyway, about his fiction that I think is worth having, right? Um, and uh, um, so that, that's what I'm going to kind of kind of do here, hopefully. Um, and I will talk a little bit about the Eternal Champion also, uh, who's a very important figure in Moorcock's fiction. And, and obviously I'll probably mention Elric, um, who's certainly Moorcock's most famous uh, fictional creation, with Jerry Cornelius probably being, you know, a close second, I think. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about Jerry maybe a little bit as well, because those books are also kind of seminal Moorcock novels. Um, okay. Uh, by the way, these are my paperbacks of Moorcock's Cox Fiction. So I've got a, I've got a bunch of trade editions too, and some hardcovers, and things like that. So this is just the paperbacks, and I think they just you know I kind of like my old paperbacks. So these are these are you know, I just kind of decided to break those out and show you guys here. So um, first of all, let me let me just explain what Moorcock's Cox Multiverse is and what the kind of conceit of it is, and and how he maybe came about this idea. Um, uh, the conceit is basically that all of Moorcock's fiction, no matter what genre he's writing in, so whether he's writing in historical, like straight historical fiction, or science fiction, or sword and sorcery, or whatever, right? Um, whatever genre he's writing in, or what, whatever book he's writing, um, these books all exist within the framework of the multiverse, meaning that all of these stories somehow happened and that these stories all happened in the same multiverse together, which means that um, you see characters recurring from different books and even completely different series who end up appearing in other series. So he can create these kind of connection points between this kind of vast web of stories that all happened together, right, in this same uh, giant fictional structure, right? Um, and uh, it's it's possibly one of the more most complicated sort of uh, web webs of, of stories that like we 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 have. Um, but here's the thing: I do want to say just to that that the novels themselves are not complicated. It's just that when you start thinking about the interrelationships, right? Uh, between them that you start to start to ask questions and things get sort of complicated. But the thing is, the fiction, no matter what series you're reading of Moorcox, right, the individual novels, the individual stories are extremely accessible. 
So uh, his fiction is not actually complicated um, with maybe a few notable exceptions, I think, um, that, that there are some series that I would say don't start with this series. It's better if you have a grounding in Moorcock's other work before you move on to this series. Um, the main one in that category, I would suggest, is the Second Ether series. Um, which is a series of novels Moorcock wrote in the early 1990s. So those ones would probably not be the ones I would suggest to start with, right? Um, uh, but, uh, the, you know, 99% of his fiction is basically, you could just pick up a book and read it, and it will be a satisfying experience. Um, no matter what it is. Sometimes even if it's in the middle of a series, you can certainly still just pick up the book and read it and have a complete experience because Moorcock is interested in delivering that to his readers. He wants to, he wants you to come away uh, being satisfied. And he comes from a slightly earlier era when giant, you know, thousand page novels, you know, uh, and there's like 10 of them in a series and whatnot, was not the sort of norm in publishing. He came from an era that, um, you know, operated on a very different model. Um, obviously, magazine publication was extremely important, uh, and many of his works were published initially and sold to magazines. Um, and then um, sometimes even novels of his were serialized in magazines, um, or selections of them were presented to magazines. And then what happened was, is then they were also then sold for publication and uh, novels at that time also were shorter. Like it was perfectly acceptable to have, you know, a 200 page book or at least a book that's less than 300 pages. A lot of his fiction is like that. Um, it's, uh, there are these shorter books basically. Um, and uh, over time we do start to see him, you know, writing, you know, some, some longer and longer uh, works. Um, but um, by and large, like, his fiction is, um, you know, not the kind of, like I said, uh, uh, giant uh, doorstopper fantasy novels that we see today, right? Um, obviously, this was, again, again, part of the model at the time. You know, paperbacks were kind of considered to be cheap entertainment and, you um, you know, and they, they were, you know, you know, thin little books you could kind of carry around in your back pocket, you know, and that, that was sort of the idea. Um, and, uh, and, you know, they, they just to have that, that, that experience of sitting down reading something and hopefully you got something out of it, you were entertained, um, maybe, you know, give you something to think about and, uh, um, and, and, you know, job done, you know, um, and I think that that, that was, that was kind of the, the ideal at the time. Obviously, I mean, that, that's true for any fiction, right? Um, but um, anyway, I just wanted to sort of point that out, that, that he comes from this earlier era where, you know, you don't have to worry about, like, you know, um, uh, like, oh, now I have to read 10 novels to, like, understand what's happening here. Um, there's none of that going on. Uh, if you just pick up a Michael Moorcock novel and read it, it should be a relatively satisfying experience in and of itself, with, like I said, a few exceptions. Um, obviously, if you come into the middle of a series or whatnot, that you just pick up, a, like, the third book in a series or something like that, you know, obviously you're, you're not going to get everything explained to you. Um, but in general, the stories themselves that happen in the course of the individual novels and stories have a complete, are completely enclosed stories that sort of have a beginning, middle, and end. And there might be threads that carry over to the next volume, but it's not like going to be that, oh, I, di I just didn't get, you know, the whole, you know, I didn't get the, uh, um, you know, a satisfying story, because um, you will. Um, okay. Um, uh, why did he come up with the multiverse, I suppose, is a good question. Uh, and the answer to that is an interesting one, because I heard him speaking about this. Um, he was talking about um, Balzac, um, Honore de, de Balzac, the French novelist. Um, and Balzac uh, had, very, had sort of two phases to his career, and I think Moorcock kind of identifies with this a little bit too, because he, I think, had sort of a similar evolution or uh, as a writer. Um, Balzac initially spent a long time, uh, he spent a long time writing what he considered to be kind of uh, 
um, just sort of hack work, uh, stuff that he was sort of pump, pumping out for uh, magazine publications and uh, stuff that he was he was making a living basically and trying to get by. Um, but his he had a desire to do more ambitious work. Um, and uh, eventually Balzac transitioned to, to doing that. And that is when he sort of came up with the idea of what he called the human comedy. And the human comedy is a series of interlinked novels where you see characters recurring in different stories. Uh, and Balzac did this for a very particular reason. Um, and he did it because um, he realized that a writer kind of has certain types and certain types of characters, or, or maybe it's even the same character um, that, the, that he started to realize, like, wait a minute, this is actually the same character in this novel as in this other novel. But, and, and the character might have had a different name and a different appearance. It's like the character's kind of wearing a different mask, so to speak, but he realized that there were only so many characters that a writer sort of has within them. So it's almost like a writer has like a repertoire company of various character types and they can put different masks and appearances on them. Uh, but in many ways, the characters end up being very similar. And in many cases, you realize they're kind of the same characters. And so Balzac realized that. And he said to himself, well, wait a minute, what if, what if I just dumped that kind of pretense of inventing another character with another name and a different appearance, but is who's very similar to other characters I've used in the past. Uh, what if I just said it was the same character? So I'll just reuse that other character that was in one novel. And then now, instead of just inventing a completely new cast of people, I'll have people from my other books that I can draw into this new book. Uh, and people will still be able to understand the story, right? But if you've read the other book, it actually adds resonance and complexity to the to to the to the works to both works actually. So you kind of get this them them sort of talking to each other. This is what I mean, kind of when I when I say that Murcox uh, fiction kind of has this complexity to it, and it's because it's you get these interesting resonances. Uh, where you see a character in one book and then you read the character in another book and the characters get presented maybe in different ways, right? Um, we get a different perspective on the character. We, the, the character's doing different things. Um, and I think that that's interesting. Uh, and that's, so, so Moorcock effectively kind of came to a similar kind of realization. Um, and, uh, he decided like, well, well, wait a minute. Why, rather than just inventing like new characters, right? Um, I can just use the same character and so kind of, kind of transfer them over. Now, interestingly enough, he has a, a sort of device that he uses, uh, that, um, uh, sort of adds to this too, because, um, these are distinct universes. So we have this multiverse, right, which basically is a, a series of these various versions of Earth. And uh, some of these Earths are, like I said, there it could be worlds of fantastic uh, sword and sorcery fantasy, um, or they can be worlds of science fiction or worlds that pretty much resemble our own world, like basically historical, you know, versions of the earth, right? Um, but they're all of these different iterations of earth and earth's history. And sometimes we see versions of earth's history where history has just been slightly altered. Well, wait a minute. Okay. Now, uh, you know, um, uh, in this version, you know, uh, um, you know, the, the, the Americans are bombing Europe, uh, but it's happening in, you know, uh, the 1970s or something like that, right? You know, um, that there's a world war going on in the 1970s. Uh, and, and suddenly you realize like, well, okay, wait a minute, this is a completely different history uh, than, than, um, than our normal history. And he often won't explain any of this to you. You have to just kind of pick it up from clues often that you're given, uh, in, 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 uh, especially in the Cornelius novels, you, you see this happening. Um, 
those novels are have a have some interesting complexity of themselves in them because you also have the fact that some of the characters in those books can move between these different realities and different time periods. So, so that also is interesting, right? So, uh, so char characters potentially can move between these different worlds, right? And when you do see that happening in um, uh, many of the stories. Um, okay, so, uh, so at the center of, of the multiverse, though, is this figure that um, is called the Eternal Champion. And of course, we have Moorcock's novel. I have his novel here. Uh, the Eternal Champion, uh, um, which um, was uh, a, a novel he wrote originally, I think it was like a novella um, written in the early 60s. And he later came back and like expanded it into like a, a, a proper novel. Um, but um, the idea of the Eternal Champion, sort of uh, this story is like one of the origin points of that. And later he takes this idea and melds it with the material he was working on in the Elric stories. So that gradually over time, uh, we see that this idea of the multiverse starts to grow. So he doesn't sit down with a plan and plan out the multiverse. Um, that's not what happened. It's something he kind of arrived at over time, right? Um, it's something that um, as he was writing his, his fiction, um, and, and he saw these connections and started to make these connections between his different works, um, that we started to see that, that this is kind of, you know, evolving. And that's the thing is that a lot of this is, is not, some of it, it sometimes comes directly into the story where like, um, you'll actually have, you know, a set of characters from different stories actually meeting each other. And that can be really exciting. Um, uh, so especially if you read the other series, you're like, oh, I know who that character is. So suddenly, you know, you see that character interacting with the character you've been reading about. Um, uh, so, but it, like I said, at the center of this is the Eternal Champion. And the Eternal Champion is an individual, uh, who is incarnated, uh, as various different heroes, effectively, I suppose that's the word we could use, um, uh, over the years, or, or, or in many of these different um, worlds, and the Eternal Champion is a catalyst for massive change that would happen in these worlds. Um, oftentimes we see these worlds undergoing massive upheavals of some kind, and the Eternal Champion sort of figures in as a sort of uh, um, as a pivot point or a catalyst for the change to happen. They bring about the, the kind of changes that um, things need to be able to move forward. Um, and uh, certainly, um, whatever the, the situation is, um, uh, the Eternal Champion um, comes in and uh, creates a, a new set of... Uh, um, uh, circumstances so that the problems of the past are now dealt with um, and at least uh, humanity now uh, can move forward and it doesn't mean it's going to be a perfect world but um, the, the the problems that be confronting humanity um, will at least be new problems rather than just the problems of you know the established um, past um, uh, many many of the things that, um, or many of the um, forces that we see uh, sort of embattling these worlds are the, are the forces of um, uh, law and chaos. Um, and Moorcock kind of um, uh, um, like manifests those things so that law and chaos are actual um, physical and metaphysical forces that are battling for control of the various worlds. Um, and you can even see this even inside of some of the novels you, you might not expect it to be in. Um, uh, but Law and Chaos fig figure importantly in, in many of, uh, much of Moorcock's fiction. And it's a nice sort of thematic um, uh, thing for him to sort of uh, um, use to sort of uh, create these sort of... Uh, sort of world uh shattering conflicts sometimes that are happening in his books um uh and so we certainly see that um in the elric novels uh 
We see that in the uh, Hawkmoon novels. We see that in the Quorum novels, and we see that in the Arakose novels. Those are the the core Eternal Champion novels. Now you can debate about whether the champion appears in the other books. I think that in many ways the the champion does. Um, but the mask the champion wears may be less overtly um, sort of uh, classically heroic in some of the other stories, that the champion becomes a more sort of complex uh, figure, sometimes a comedic figure, um, and sometimes a very mixed figure, where, uh, it, you know, the idea of uh, the champion as a good guy, so to speak, that that, um, that, that, that isn't really what we're dealing with at all. Um, morality in Moorcock, there, there are often a clear moral stakes in his books as far as, like, what, what is going on. Uh, in the story, um, uh, there, there's often clear moral stakes in, in some ways, but also I think that his characters um, have a kind of moral complexity to them sometimes. Um, uh, Elric, for example, is is a, is a type of anti-hero, I suppose we, we can say, um, in, in some cases. Um, he uh, often intends to do certain things, but that is not how uh, those things sort of turn out for him. Um, he's a tragic hero in that sense, sort of, uh, um, you know, in the vein of sort of gothic and romantic heroes of, of the past. And Moorcock has said effectively that, um, uh, that when he was writing the Elric books, that, that that's, a, that's one of the things he drew on, right, was that um, sword and sorcery had been an established genre, but nobody had kind of gone back to the well to say, okay, we're going to pull in more gothic influences or or influences from romanticism or um let's let's take the byronic hero as manifested in those kind of romantic uh, uh and gothic works let's take that byronic hero type and and take that character and use that in a sword and sorcery novel um and so elric becomes kind of emblematic of of that um and he's an extremely, uh, I think, a, original creation in that sense, um, uh, despite the fact that he's also inspired by, um, uh, like, that particular aspect, for one thing. Uh, but also he's directly inspired by a character that Moorcock uh, has talked about, uh, Monsieur Zenith. And Zenith uh, was a villain character in the Sexton Blake novels. Uh, Sexton Blake was a kind of series detective, uh, sort of like Sherlock Holmes, uh, who ran in a series of sort of uh, monthly kind of novels that came out. Um, and uh, um, Zenith uh, was one of his uh, arch enemies, basically. And uh, sort of not sort of like Professor Moriarty, but he was the kind of master criminal, and uh, he had a kind of flair to him. Uh, but his appearance was, you know, um, unusual. He had the this like bone white skin and red eyes, um, and he uh, had various kind of like uh, like um, I think he has a ring with like poison in it and and. Uh, cigarettes laced with opium that he would smoke and like um, a very kind of decadent kind of figure in many ways um, but uh, like a, a very stylish supervillain um, and so Moorcock was kind of enamored over this character when he was younger and so because you read those Bla Sexton Blake novels Moorcock would later when he grew up uh, go on to write for Sexton Blake library so he actually did write a few Sexton Blake stories um, I don't think he he used Zenith in any of those stories. Uh, for I'm, I'm you know I'm not sure for why exactly, but but um, uh, at any rate, um, uh, um, maybe that because I'm not sure if uh, that who who sort of had control over that character exactly. Um, but um, at any rate, uh, he took aspects of that character. He took the kind of gothic romantic thing. He then used those stories, or, or not those stories, those ideas, and sort of combined that with a kind of inversion of Conan the Barbarian. So that, that this character, Elric, ends up being a kind of uh, inverted Conan uh, in many ways. So that it, as we see, Conan is a kind of barbarian figure 
from a, a, a people who are kind of destroyed, uh, who then sort of fights his way to across the kind of various kingdoms of the Hyborian Age to eventually sort of, um, and has like a series of, of uh, you know, adventures and whatnot, but eventually sort of fights his way to a throne and becomes a king himself. Um, but that is, that in, that's a very sort of, and, and, and Howard was notably um, an American, right? And there's a kind of like, you know, rags to riches kind of, you know, uh, you know, country boy uh, makes good kind of uh, um, aspect to that, that story, right? So there's something, you know, something going on there with Howard. Um, but Moorcock isn't American, he's British, and he has a different perspective on uh, those sorts of things. And so Elric is like, uh, um, he's, a, he's an emperor of, a, of an empire that is failing, and uh, and we, we see kind of what happens with him in this. So he sort of ends up becoming a, uh, a king who, or an emperor who loses his kingdom, right? Um, and becomes a kind of wandering her heroic figure, sort of. Uh, I, I say heroic uh, with a sort of question mark right there, because I mean, Elric, as I said, often functions as a kind of um, anti-hero, right? Um, he, he's a hero villain in some ways. Um, he often is on the side of right, but uh, he is a character who is, there's often great costs to both himself and especially the people around him uh, for his actions. Um, and uh, and that, that, that a lot of people suffer um, uh, based on what you know, he does. Um, so I, I, anyway, I just, I think he's a fascinating character, um, and has this, uh, a lot of these kind of inspirations. So the, where Moorcock's, um, sort of originality, I think really comes in here is the way he sort of has created, taken all of those elements of the things I mentioned and sort of put them all in a stew together so that, um, you know, Elric comes out as a, as a fairly, you know, unique figure. In that sense, despite the fact that also there's been a lot of characters, I think, over the years subsequently uh, that who have been inspired by Elric, certainly. Um, uh, and uh, you can talk about, you know, to what degree like the Targaryens in the Game of Thrones novels are, in fact, inspired by Elric. Um, there are some definite um, connections there we can we can see being made um, uh, where we have, you know, the Targaryens being sort of pale-faced, uh, white-haired uh, sort of uh, people from a, a dying uh, sort of decadent empire uh, where they rode dragons, right? Um, and uh, um, you, see, you see that also with, with the Melnomenaeans, uh, Elric's people who are also a dragon-riding, you know, people, right? Um, Elric's sword, Stormbringer, of course, is a, is a sort of, uh, the, the black sword, as it is called, uh, is a sword that drains the souls of the people who, um, who he kills with it. And, uh, um, it, in doing so, it provides Elric sustenance so that he is kind of, he functions almost like a vampire in that sense, that he's, He's uh, feeding off the energy of the people he's killed. Um, and uh, this is made more complex because Elric himself is somebody who has a kind of uh, uh, disability in the sense that he has a kind of what uh, Moorcock calls a natural lassitude uh, so that he is uh, ill effectively. And uh, without drugs and medicine, uh, it notes he would barely be able to raise his hand you know, in the air, he can't even hardly move, right? He'd be bedridden uh, if he didn't have these particular drugs and medicines that he requires. Um, however, if he has Stormbringer and Stormbringer has fed on, you know, the souls of people, then it passes some of that vitality on to Elric. And Elric uh, thus doesn't need, if he has Stormbringer, he doesn't need um, uh, to take those uh, um, herbs and medicines I mentioned, uh, that he can just function. And in fact, he becomes even, you know, can become quite uh, um, physically potent 
uh, if he's uh, um, fed enough of the sword's vitality, right? Um, uh, and so, uh, so that, that, that kind of contrasting aspect to the character of tremendous power uh, and tremendous weakness sort of uh, existing simultaneously uh, within the character. Um, and I, that's a fascinating character, right, to have, right, to write that character. Um, uh, okay, so, so Elric is probably the most important of the Eternal Champion uh, versions, and it's also the version that Moorcock is um, uh, kind of still able to write, uh, he mentions. Uh, and I think that there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, because he kind of saw eventually that the other the other characters he felt like I think he told their stories and they didn't have more stories to tell whereas Elric he, he did feel like maybe there was still more things he could say with the character um it's also worth noting that that he's spoken about this in in some of his writings that uh Elric himself and his particular attitudes right and his views on the world and his sort of uh, questioning nature um, and uh, his um, uh, expressions in anger and revenge and those sorts of things were in some ways uh, reflective of Moorcock's own feelings uh, when he was a young man. So uh, he wrote the Elric stories when he was um, in his very early 20s and uh, um, was heavily identifying with that character. Um, and that character does feel like, in many ways, a character that is reflective of someone in their early 20s and the kind of feelings and frustrations and ambitions and uh, um, passions that a, that a young person sort of has. Um, you know, it, um, but what's interesting is Moorcock has continued to write, you know, Elric's fiction over such a long period of time that clearly the writer's own views on the character have sort of changed. As Moorcock has gotten older, uh, um, he, Elric is still the same character, right, as he was, even though the writer, and now we the readers also, we may not be the same people, you know, we were before. So, but Elric kind of just always is Elric, right? Um, so, but, but there's interesting things I think you can do with that, and you can make interesting sort of commentaries uh, with him as a character. And the stories built around him obviously changed. So Moorcock's um, uh, later books uh, involving Elric start to tie into uh, some of the uh, bigger historical things he's written about in some of his other books. And they tie in especially to some of his historical fantasies, um, the, von, the Von Beck novels in particular. Um, uh, so, uh, but anyway, uh, so I think that this also uh, is, is a good place to sort of mention that the multiverse itself over time kind of continues to evolve. Uh, his work in the sixties, um, there, I think that the idea of the multiverse was there, but it was still very notional and it was all kind of gradually being st stitched together. It's not until we get into the 1970s that Moorcock has done more work to kind of create a more cohesive kind of cohesive connection points. And so the, 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 the bigger structure we can see sort of uh, is already in place um, very apparently by the 1970s. Uh, by the mid-1970s, we already have the, the, this major story that he, he has with all the eternal champions uh, um, who are all the same person, effectively. They are all incarnations of the same individual reincarnated in different versions, right? But because of a special, like, you know, circumstance that arises, uh, there becomes a situation where they need to actually summon the various uh, aspects of the Eternal Champion uh, to come together. Um, Moorcock has uh, uh, talked about how he's always been a Doctor Who fan uh, um, from relatively, I think, early on in the series. So uh, the, we're talking about original Who, although I know he also enjoys the new series as well. Uh, and in fact, did write um, a Doctor Who novel um, several years ago now. Um, but um, he, he's always been a fan of that show. And of course, it makes me wonder whether 
some of his ideas about uh, summoning the various aspects of the Eternal Champion to like meet each other when the Eternal Champions are effectively the reincarnations of the same person, whether that was in fact, uh, at least to some degree, informed by um, some of the Doctor Who stories we see, uh, particularly the story, The Three Doctors, where you get the three different versions of the Doctor kind of coming together to solve a, um, a problem that threatens the entire cosmos, right? You know, and uh, we see something like that happening where the different incarnations of the Eternal Champion have to come together to fight a, um, a an enemy that threatens not just one universe, but threatens all of the universe, threatens the entire multiverse. Um, and then there's kind of uh, ramifications and repercussions potentially because of that. Um, but uh, um, that, that's a, that's a, um, that story, uh, if you read the Elric novels, I think that's now the third, that happens in what's now the third novel in the sequence. Um, the, the book is called The Sailor on the Seas of Fate. Um, and uh, it's, it's, a, it's the first part of that book. Um, and it's sort of a, a, a contained story. And that, of course, when I was reading the Elric books, which were the first um, Moorcock works that I read, of course, um, that's where I was introduced to uh, characters like Eric Jose, who appears in The Eternal Champion. Uh, I was introduced to Coram. I was introduced to Hawkmoon, uh, and uh, th who appears in other Moorcock novels. Um, so I was introduced to these other characters, and that's when I went out and then read those series. So it was also from a kind of uh, um, uh, being a writer trying to get your um, uh, readers to get to buy your other works, right? It was a pretty good tactic, right? Um, because um, uh, I, Neil Gaiman uh, has written a story called uh, One Life Furnished in Early Moorcock, and uh, the character in that is a young kid who who is in the 1970s who's buying all these like Moorcock paperbacks and reading them. And uh, um, one of the one of the things he notes is, is that like Elric was like for this kid, he was like Elric was his favorite. Right. Of all the Moorcock characters. Uh, and he's and the kid kind of realized that that Moorcock and or that that uh, um, Hawkmoon and Elric and, and Eric Jose and these various characters all were incarnations of the same person. They were still, and so so secretly the kid was like, oh, well, you know, even though it's a Hawkmoon novel, you know, it's secretly actually an Elric novel too, because Elric is connected to Hawkmoon, right? Um, and so that's why the kid, you know, so he loved Elric so much, he went out and he's like, oh, I'm going to read the Hawkmoon books. Now, it's interesting, I do know there's pe various people uh, who I... You know, see online uh, talking about Moorcock's work and things like that, and uh, many people actually do prefer some of those other characters to Elric, um, uh, and that's only uh, that's understandable because uh, you know not every character is going to appeal to everybody uh, for whatever reasons. Your sensibilities just might be different. Um, Elric can be a tremendously unlikable character at times as well. Um, you have to kind of be on board with him, I think, as your kind of hero villain protagonist to sort of follow him around. Um, but he's got so much cool stuff. He just, he just is such a cool character. I mean, I, I w I've been enamored of Elric since I was, you know, a kid. And uh, I think he's a, he's a sort of, like I said, he, he, if you're a young person and you read those stories, they can have a lot of impact on you, I think. Um, and uh, anyway, but uh, I, I just think that's um, uh, interesting. Uh, so, okay. Um, but okay, so these things have evolved over the years also. Moorcock has been writing multiverse novels now from the early 60s, like I said, when this kind of starts to come together, all the way through until today you know, and uh, we, the, the, the kind of complexity of the project has sort of uh, altered over the years. Uh, that This is where we get to, and by the time you get to the second Ether trilogy, uh, which happens in the early 1990s, that trilogy is kind of like trying to take some of the things from the multiverse and kind of trying to push this into a new space and we're going to get a new look at many of the things and characters we'd seen in other versions 
right? So the second ether kind of becomes a kind of reinvention in a sense of the multiverse. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it, those novels are also very different in the way they're written than a lot of Moorcock's earlier fiction. Um, they're more, they're genre novels and they're, they're sort of sci science fantasy novels in a sense. Um, but they, um, they're very unusual. And uh, I don't know that, and they're not the most accessible novels in the world, I think, for new readers. Um, I had a tremendous amount of time, uh, a tremendously hard time kind of getting into those books. Um, and I am still very curious about them. Uh, they also informed uh, the comic series that um, Moorcock did with Walt Simonson, in the early 1990s called Michael Moorcock's Multiverse. That literally was the name of the comic series. Um, and I have the graphic novel. It was published by DC Vertigo. Um, and uh, um, it, it is a good series um, uh, drawn uh, by several different artists, um, Walt Simonson being the most notable probably amongst the, the various artists. Um, uh, and it's, I, I loved, uh, Simonson's artwork in that. It's just, it's, it's amazing Walt Simonson art, which is, you know, not, you know, his, his art is generally always pretty amazing. Um, uh, but the story was, again, it was very strange. Um, and, uh, I think that that series, uh, in particular benefited from having like Simonson's kind of visuals because there was so much weird stuff in the, those books that like seeing it kind of visualized out for you, I think had a kind of, it gave it an interesting resonance. Um, so again, that's not a series I would say, go, go start reading Moorcock with that. If you've been reading Moorcock for a while and you feel like you're uh, ready for something a bit weirder and a bit different, uh, the second ether books are not a bad place to go. Um, but he's also got so many different books. That's the thing. It just kind of depends on what you're looking for. Um, uh, I mentioned the Elric novels. Those are kind of, like I said, uh, those are sort of romantic Gothic sword and sorcery, basically. Um, and then we have probably Moorcock's other most famous character, who is Jerry Cornelius, who is a kind of counterculture figure um, that arose out of Moorcock's, it's, he's a science fiction character um, involving uh, time travel and whatnot. Um, who uh, in various different alternate realities um, and, uh, and, and kind of dealing with the themes of entropy and empire and whatnot, which are again, common themes in Moorcock's work. Um, but Jerry comes out of the concerns Moorcock had in the 1960s, really, um, and uh, trying to talk about kind of what was going on, right, at the time uh, through the lens of this kind of like very flamboyant um, uh, pop culture character, right? Um, Jerry Cornelius, who is a kind of uh, um, everything to everyone kind of character in some ways. He's uh, um, uh, he, he's a character uh, um, that uh, changes. Um, uh, um, appearance that, you know, changes uh, various aspects, uh, changes his dress, changes aspects of himself um, constantly uh, in these various kind of incarnations um, that we see him in. So in some ways, Jerry is uh, like the eternal champion who manifests in all these different worlds. Jerry is a singular person who then seems to have all these different identities based in sometimes in different timelines, um, but also um, uh, we, we wonder like, are Jerry and the other people in the Cornelius books, some of them are uh, able to even tra tra uh, potentially uh, transport themselves potentially between the various timelines. Um, Jerry is an assassin, a rock star, um, you know, like, uh, um, uh, you know, kind of everything. Uh, and um, uh, he's a very strange character uh, in many ways. Uh, and in many ways, as the series goes on, this is the funny thing, that the series becomes interestingly less and less interested in Jerry. Um, Jerry becomes a, a more uh, 
uh, remote figure in the later books. Uh, and I'm not going to, I don't know if there's, it's really even possible to spoil things in those books because those books are, are very strange. It's also uh, in the recent republication of the Cronus Chronicles, which are right here, by the way, this is my old copy. I've got the new editions though that I think Titan put out. Um, uh, and uh, th they do note in the new edition, I think this is interesting, that you can um, uh, read them in any order. Um, uh, if you wanted, you could just pick up the, but, but there are certain benefits to reading them in order, but, um, but there's no plot that, so you could pick up book three and read that and you'd be fine. Uh, book four, I think definitely has a kind of ending of a sort. Um, but it's, it's not a conventional plot, like plot is not the important thing going on in the Cornelius Chronicles, uh, just FYI. You're reading because of the ideas, you're reading because of the imagery, um, you're reading because of the kind of scenes and, and, and whatnot, and also the kind of commentary that's kind of going on, the metaphors, all of those things are kind of, kind of uh, pinging along here. But plot is there, but it's not the reason you kind of come to these books. You know, Morcock's not reading some like um, intricate uh, plot line that is going to like, you know, like unfold before us and pay off um, in, in a conventional way. And that's because those books are, are essentially kind of also experimental a little bit that he was um, uh, sort of casting around to try to find a way to deal with these uh, subjects that he was so concerned about. Um, at the time, like I said, the issues of um, uh, a lot of things going on in the 60s, um, like I said, identity being a big part of them. Um, uh, anyway, uh, so is that everything I wanted to say? Well, uh, there's Moorcock's work also, there's been graphic adaptations and whatnot, so uh, there's been a lot of comics of his work over the years, and Warcock, as I mentioned, worked uh, in the comics industry, uh, well, at least in Britain, uh, in the early 60s. Um, he worked on various characters and stuff, often, I think, uncredited. Um, uh, if you go, you can hunt around and try and find um, uh, discussions online about what, what magazines he wrote for, and whatnot. And he, I think, he wrote so much of it also. Um, some of it he's uh, less sure about, but there's various like bibliographers and people uh, who try to kind of put together like what exactly were the stories Moorcock like wrote and whatnot. Um, uh, but um, he's also, you know, uh, written uh, comics um, more recently. Uh, this this probably being a notable example, which is he wrote an Eternal Champion novel. After he kind of finished the sequence, he 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 had one kind of uh, thought, which is that because uh, Howard Chaikin had had sort of approached him with the who the comics artist Howard Chaikin, they they were um, friends, and Howard Chaikin had approached Moorcock with the idea of like, hey, we should we should like you know do something together. Um, and, uh, um, Moorcock, uh, decided that, oh, it'd be fun to do an Eternal Champion story, um, and resolve a couple things that he'd been thinking about. Um, uh, and, uh, so he wrote this, this, uh, graphic novel, which has, like, maybe one of my favorite titles of all time, which is, uh, uh, the, and it's got this beautiful Howard Chaikin cover. Uh, this is, uh, it's published by Heavy Metal. So Heavy Metal presents Michael Moorcock's The Swords of Heaven, The Flowers of Hell. Uh, just a, just a wonderful title. Um, uh, and, and a great, and a really, uh, interesting, uh, fun book, um, with a lot of, uh, it was done in 79, as you can see there, at least that's the painting there. Um, and yeah, you got, uh, uh, only six ninety ninety five <laughs> for this graphic novel, which is cool. Um. Anyway, uh, uh, that that that's a that's a really fun one. Uh, obviously, there's an adaptation of the Elric books, and I think I've showed this before. This is uh, Pete, Roy Thomas and Pete Craig Russell, um, and Thomas and Russell uh, went on for Russell particularly. Um, basically, uh, had a long run uh, 
uh, at adapting, you know, the Elric stories and uh, some of his, and, and, and P. Craig Russell, if you're not familiar with his artwork, but his art is absolutely amazing. I mean, you can see that right here in this picture. And of course, that's a picture of Elric. Um, and this is an adaptation of the very first Elric story, The Dreaming City. Um, not the first story chronologically, it is the sto first story uh, that was written. So again, that's another thing about the Elric series is pretty typically for sword and sorcery stories, they were not written uh, chronologically. So that like he wrote them uh, um, in a different order than the chronological stories happen in. So like the very first stories Marcock wrote were effectively stories that show up in what is now the third book, or actually is it the third book it's the fourth book rather weird of the white wolf which is i have that right here so uh the dreaming city is in this book it's book the, it, the, at this time it was book three but he subsequently wrote another novel uh fortress of the pearl which comes uh before uh come w w got got slotted in later so again this is why this is a little complicated um if you buy the current edition uh, that's out. There's a new collection out that's just called Elric of Melnibide. I think that that's what it's called. Um, and it collects basically the, all of the novels in chronological order. And it's like the first half. And then you get the second half of the Elric series in the subsequent volume, which is called Stormbringer. So that collects all the later books. And then there's a third volume, which is like the weirder later stuff that has connections to his other series and I think that one's called The White Wolf's Son because um, there's a whole other trilogy Moorcock wrote uh, in the early 2000s that um, involves Elric but ties him into a bunch of other uh, um, uh, stuff involving especially the, the Von Back novels uh, and, and other, some of Moorcock's other works. Um, Anyway, I, I've gone on for like 50 minutes here talking about this, so hopefully this is interesting or informative for you guys. Um, and again, I'll, there's so much to talk about with Moorcock's work. Um, maybe at some point I'll dig into some of the individual books. But uh, um, for now, uh, um, hopefully this was useful to you guys. And, uh, you know, go out and uh, read some Michael Moorcock novels is what I would say. Um, and uh, just pick one up. If you want a good one to read... Uh, the Eternal Champion is a pretty good one. Uh, um, that's not that's a, that's a good one to start with, uh, and or uh, pick up uh, the first. Uh, like I said, that that collection of the Elric series. Um, those are both good places to to start. Uh, if you're interested in reading the Cornelius novels, uh, which are a little bit weirder and sort of countercultury and uh, have a lot of uh, you know strange and interesting characters in it. Uh, um, go ahead in, uh, in in a very 1960s kind of psychedelic way. If you're interested in, in reading those, uh, then definitely go pick up the final program. That's the first volume in the Cornelia series. Again, it kind of doesn't matter what order you read those in, but the final program would be the one I would start with. Um, if you've not, especially if you've not read Moorcock before. Um, other books of his that, uh, standalones that, um, I particularly enjoy, um, uh, Gloriana is kind of, uh, an Elizabethan, uh, sort of, uh, novel that's an alternate history, but it's also a fantasy novel and it's kind of an erotic novel too. So, um, it's, it's a interesting kind of, kind of story. Um, but there's, there's a there's a lot of different uh, genres and things to dip your toes in here, um, uh, but yeah, just just you know go read everybody and uh, um, uh, um, let me know what you guys think about any of this and um, uh, thank you uh, if you can please like and subscribe I'm gonna say the thing you're supposed to say on YouTube um, please like and subscribe and I will catch you guys in the next video thank you so much.